Good morning, everyone. Thank you and welcome to Teledyne ISCO's October webinar focusing on flow monitoring technologies. Today's webinar will be run by Daryl Kuda, Teledyne ISCO's product support specialist. All questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. For questions throughout the presentation, please use the chat function within the Zoom platform. At this time, I will turn it over to Daryl. Hello, I'm Daryl Kuda. I'm going to discuss the flow monitoring technologies available for open channel flow monitoring. So today we're going to discuss which technology should I use for open channel flow monitoring. I'm going to discuss the sensor types, where they're used, the different types of technology for the sensors, and the advantages and disadvantages of each type of sensor. There are some variables to consider when monitoring flow. You need to know what the channel shape is. You need to know what the liquid depth is. Uh, it's an important factor in open channel flow monitoring. Uh, the level is used for area calculations in open channel, and it's also used for the level to flow calculation in uh, primary devices. And then we also need to know what the liquid velocity is. Some of the things we'll be discussing are the primary devices, such as weirs and flumes, and open channel flow monitoring, which could be in a round or rectangular channel. So some of the common types of sensors that are used in flow monitoring are going to be the ultrasonic sensor, the bubbler, the submerged pressure transducer, a continuous wave area velocity sensor, and a non-contact area velocity sensor, such as the laser flow. So let's start with the ultrasonic sensor. An ultrasonic sensor is a non-contact sensor mounted above the flow stream. The transducer transmits a sound wave which reflects off the water or the surface and is and detects the echo, which is a function of time, uh, a function of time, how long it takes to transmit the signal and re then receive the signal will determine what the distance is to the surface of the water, which can then be calculated into a level. Now, all ultrasonic sensors have a dead band. And the reason they have a dead band is because the transducers need a certain amount of time to transmit and then receive the signal. And dead bands uh, vary depending on the sensor, which can be anywhere from uh, commonly two inches up to two feet for the dead band. So some of the advantages and disadvantages of an ultrasonic sensor, we'll start with the advantages. It's non-contact sensor. It's mounted above the flow stream, uh, which makes it uh, easier to install and uh, safer to install the sensor. It's maintenance free because it's uh, above the flow stream. We don't have to worry about cleaning debris off the sensor. It won't get hung up um, you know, by rags or other debris coming through your flume or weir. Now, some of the disadvantages are the dead band. Uh, depending on your application, you may not have you know, one foot above your flow stream to be able to mount the sensor. The beam aim angle could also be a problem uh, depending on the size of the channel. If it's very narrow, the uh, angle of the beam may hit the side walls and then uh, thus be in the dead band, or you may get some false echoes off the side walls. Wind can also be a factor because we're transmitting a sound wave, which can be essentially blown away by the wind, which would reduce the signal strength. Steam can also be an issue with an ultrasonic because it will bounce off the micro water particles in the air, uh, which it may be reflecting in the dead band or give you a false signal. Foam can also be an issue because it will absorb the ultrasonic signal and, and might not even reach the surface. And so you, if you have a foaming in your channel, an ultrasonic would not be a good option because you may not get a level reading. And turbulence. Last is uh, can be an issue for an ultrasonic because uh, ultrasonics are looking for a flat, smooth surface to get a returned echo. If there's a lot of turbulence, the uh, sound wave will then be dispersed away from the transducer, giving the UA reduced signal strength or possibly no reading at all. Now the bubbler, how that works, it has a air pump usually built into the meter. The air pump builds up pressure into an air tank and then it's slowly released through a control valve. And the bubbles are usually released at a rate of about one to two bubbles per second. And then the pressure transducer 
measures the amount of pressure it takes to push out one bubble out of the end of that bubble line. And the higher the head height or water height above the end of that bubble line will take more pressure to push out the bubble, which is directly related to the level. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of the bubbler? First, the advantages, we can use it in a small channel. Usually it's an eighth inch uh, bubble line that's in the, in the water. Uh, they're not affected by wind, steam, or foam, or even turbulence because the bubble line is below the water. Where the ultrasonic needed a flat surface, the uh, bubbler is under the water and it's not affected by those things. Um, the bubbler is not affected by temperature because we do not have any electronics in the water. It's usually just a vinyl or stainless steel line that is in the water. And last, uh, lightning, because we uh, you have a vinyl or stainless steel line in the water, it is not affected by uh, lightning because we don't have any electronics in the flow stream. And only the bubble tube is in contact with the flow. And um, bubblers are highly accurate because they are not affected by uh, the, the wind or steam or foam. And usually, the uh, bubbler is an inexpensive option uh, because you're running a vinyl bubble line into your flow stream. So if you have uh, anything damaging the line, such as uh, lawnmowers or somebody uh, pinching the line, uh, it's, it's an inexpensive vinyl bubble line going to your flume or weir, which is uh, easily replaced. Now the disadvantages is uh, you can have potential for a restricted bubble line. So if, if you have a lot of sediment or silt, it could plug up the end of the bubble line. The ISCO flow meters have an automatic purge system to try to blow out the bubble line to reduce the restriction on the end of the bubble line. But sometimes maintenance is required while you have to uh, go in there, clean out the debris, or even um, run a wire through the bubble line to try to clean it out. And the, the bubblers can have a greater power consumption, uh, especially if you have a long line uh, where the, uh, the air pump has to turn on uh, quite often because it's doing excessive purging. It could use uh, more power than an ultrasonic sensor. Next, we have the pressure transducer, uh, which is usually a differential pressure transducer. And most pressure sensors are referenced to atmospheric pressure and uh, they can either send back a digital signal to the flow meter or sometimes an analog signal, uh, which is proportional to the water depth. So the advantages of a pressure sensor, you can use in small channels. Uh, they're not affected by the wind, steam, foam, or turbulence because it is below the surface of the water. Uh, the good thing about the pressure transducer is that if it does become covered with silt or sediment, it can still sense the head pressure and give you an accurate uh, level reading, even with uh, silt over the top of the sensor. Now the disadvantages is uh, chemicals in the flow stream, because when we have electronics in the flow stream, uh, they, you have to keep in mind what chemicals may be going through there that may attack the plastic. Flowing debris, uh, because the sensor is in the flow stream, uh, you have to be careful that uh, debris uh, may catch on the sensor, possibly uh, fouling it or even tearing it out. Uh, temperature can be a problem. Um, most pressure sensors are temperature compensated, um, or you, if they do not have a temperature sensor built into it, you will have to uh, place the sensor in the water for approximately five minutes to let it uh, acclimate to the water temperature. Otherwise, it could create a slight shift in your level reading. And uh, lightning can also be can be an issue with this because you have electronics in the water, and the lightning would damage the electronics. Now on to the primary devices. So uh, the level sensors were considered a secondary device uh, used to read the level, and they're used in conjunction with primary devices such as a weir. What is a weir? It's a dam built across an open channel which water flows over, and so we're concerned about the amount of water that goes over the top of the weir to do our flow calculation. And uh, weirs are commonly made from metal, concrete, or even uh, weir it wood if it's a temporary application. And flumes are a specifically shaped channel uh, which then directs the flow through the channel to accelerate it, uh, which essentially makes it uh, uh, self-cleaning. The flumes are commonly made of fiberglass or even concrete. 
and the size of the plume or weir uh, is dependent on the flow range that you're expecting. So what does a weir look like? Uh, this is the side angle of a weir. And so as far as a weir, as I mentioned, it's a, a wall or a dam across an open channel. So it's not suitable for applications with high solids because the solids can build up in front of the weir, which would then require cleaning. A couple things about a weir, the sensor placement uh, should be at three to four times uh, the expected head height over the weir uh, in, front, in front of the weir. And, uh, and the reason you want to mount the sensor a uh, minimum of three uh, diameters uh, in front of the, the weir or crest is that if it's too close, it will be in the drawdown um, right before the, the weir plate. Now this is an example of a rectangular weir using a bubble tube. Um, so they're using the bubbler technology to read the level. Uh, we easily could have used an ultrasonic sensor on this. And, and if you have a staff gauge, that does make it easier to do your on-site calibration. If the staff gauge uh, was not there, uh, one way to calibrate your level would be to, if possible, stop the flow of water through there and you would set the level to zero when the water is equal to the top of the crest. Another common type of weir is the V-notch weir. And the uh, V-notch is used, used in the uh, lower flow applications. And uh, the size of the weir is going to depend on uh, how, what your expected uh, flow rate is through the channel. And so the, the size will depend, depend on how much water is going to go over the top. When, so if you know your expected flow, you can, uh, that's where you're going to determine how far upstream you're going to place the ultrasonic sensor and then uh, the channel from the bottom of the crest should be at least two times the maximum head uh, to determine the, the size of the weir. Uh, the ISCO flow data handbook has uh, excellent examples of uh, sizing your weir. Um, uh, please consult the ISCO website to uh, get a copy of the flow data handbook. So where are the weirs used? Um, Commonly, they're used at the effluent of a wastewater treatment plant uh, because the solids have been removed. Uh, they can be used for industrial discharge and even on streams. So what are the advantages of a weir? They're low cost, and especially if it's made out of wood or metal. It's a pretty simple design. Um, so they're easy to, in, to design and install. The disadvantage is that uh, you have the higher head loss because we're putting a wall uh, across your flow stream, so it's going to back up your flow. Um, it can require periodic cleaning depending on if we have that debris going through there, so it's not suitable for flows with solids. Uh, and the accuracy <clears throat> is affected by the excess approach velocity, so uh, you would not put this on an application that had uh, fast moving. Uh, velocity approaching it, and then uh, the approach channel should be a minimum of 20 times the maximum head height. Uh, so you, you'll want a, a good straight run of channel or pipe before a weir. The other type of primary device is a flume. The three components of a flume are the converging section, uh, which is the approach side where you're going to do your level measurement. And uh, most flumes will, when you order a flume, if you tell them what type of technology you're going to use, a bubbler, submerge probe, or ultrasonic, they will build that into the flume uh, so there's no guesswork as to where to read your level from. The throat section, that uh, determines what size of flume you have. And so you're going to measure across the narrow part of the flume, that will determine the size. And and by design, with having the throat narrower, it's going to accelerate the water going through the flume, which essentially makes it self-cleaning. And then last, we have the diverging section where the water exits the flume. Here we have an example of a partial flume with the ultrasonic sensor. It has a built-in staff gauge, and as you notice, the hourglass shape uh, makes it easily identified as a partial flume. Other types you may come across are the Palmer Bolus flume, 
the polymer bolus, what's nice about them is that uh, they can easily be retrofitted to an existing pipe. As in this picture, it uh, shows they cut the pipe and they just uh, use couplers to attach the polymer bolus flume in that channel. You may also see a trapezoidal flume. Uh, the nice thing about a trapezoidal flume is that it can cover uh, uh, low flows and higher flows because of the narrow uh, bottom of the flume. It can uh, read the lower flows and then it, it, as the walls expand, it allows it to capture higher flows. And other flumes you may come across are the H-series flume. Uh, so if you have an application that uh, just has a free fall or we don't have have a uh, pipe connected to the backside of the channel, um, the H flume is a good option. So where are they used? Uh, they're used a lot of times at the influent wastewater treatment plants uh, due to the high amount of solids coming in and with a flume being self-cleaning, it works out well. You can use it for stormwater discharge and industrial discharge. And the level sensors we discussed can also be used for tank monitoring. Um, most commonly, the ultrasonic sensor is used for monitoring tank levels. So, what if you don't have a weir or flume? How are you going to monitor the flow? So, open channel flow monitoring without a primary device uh, could be any uh, channel like a round pipe or a rectangular channel that, um, in this case it can be an open channel or the pipe can be completely full and it would still be considered an open channel. So how do we read flow if we do not have a primary device? We need to know the geom geometry of the pipe, if it's a round pipe, rectangular channel, so we can use that to calculate the area. We need to know the depth of the of the flow, so using the sensors we were talking about before, this will tell me the wetted cross-sectional area of the pipe. And then we need to know what the average velocity is. So when I know the wetted area of the pipe and the velocity, I can calculate a flow rate, area times the velocity. So here's a, uh, an in-pipe area velocity sensor. It has a pressure transducer to read the water depth, which will give us the wetted cross-sectional area. It will transmit a 500 kilohertz signal into the flow stream, and so we will read the Doppler shift of the, from the uh, particles and air bubbles in the water to give us the velocity. Now, a non-contact way to read uh, in an open channel for area velocity flow monitoring is with the laser flow sensor. It uses an ultrasonic sensor to read the water depth to know the distance to the surface of the water. It will transmit a laser below the surface of the water, thus looking for the peak velocity. And how the laser operates is the laser turns on, the laser uh, diode is moved backwards or forwards to focus the laser through a lens below the surface of the water. It uh, reflects the energy or the, the frequency shift uh, from the particles in the water back through the lens into the laser. And then the frequency shift will also it'll determine the velocity and it will help us determine what the direction of the velocity is moving. So where are area velocity sensors used? They're used in open channels, which can be small pipe, and say six inches up to 36 inch pipes. We can use them in large channels as well, you know, if we have a uniform flow or velocity going through the large channel. They can also be used in uh, uh, stormwater applications and natural channels. Uh, Non-contact sensors work great for this because you may have large debris such as branches and shopping carts and other things going through uh, the open channels. And so by having a non-contact sensor, it's going to be out of the flow stream, which is uh, uh, going to help it be more maintenance free. So what are the advantages of area velocity? Um, there's no weir or flume, uh, which uh, reduces the installation cost. Uh, there's no need to estimate the slope or roughness of the pipe because we're reading the actual velocity. Uh, no profiling is required with the area velocity sensors. And uh, 
with an area velocity sensor, we can uh, read flow in open channels, uh, submerged pipes, full pipes, surcharged, and reverse reverse flows. So they're very versatile. Uh, commonly, the area velocity sensors are used in in the applications where the primary device has been known to surcharge, which when the water goes above the flume, they're no longer accurate. So you can take an area velocity sensor, put it upstream in the pipe, and continue to get accurate flow readings. Now the disadvantages of area velocity is uh, debris or silting over the top of an in-pipe area velocity sensor, so it may require cleaning. Uh, other things that can affect an area velocity sensor are the turbulence or swirling in front of the sensor to give it a false reading or possibly no reading if it can't detect which direction the velocity is moving. So, you've seen a lot of different uh, types of technologies. Uh, which one should I use? As you've seen, there's no one technology that uh, can be used for all applications. That's why we offer a wide variety of sensors. So your decisions should depend on, one, if you already have a weir or a flume already in place, fantastic. You can use one of the uh, uh, level sensors only. If it's an open channel where you do not have a primary device, um, you either have the option to install a weir or a flume, which uh, could be expensive, or install an uh, area velocity sensor. And then when picking the, uh, the sensor, uh, determine what, how much maintenance may be involved. You know, if you do have a lot of debris going through there, you definitely do not want to use a weir. Um, if there's a lot of debris going through your channel, using the non-contact is going to be your better choice. So you have a lot of things to consider when you're selecting your full monitoring device. So I appreciate your time today. With that, uh, if you have any questions, please submit them on the chat line. So one of the questions is, uh, does an ultrasonic sensor require a sunshade? Well, it depends on if the uh, sensor is in uh, direct sunlight. Uh, so as far as the, uh, the, if an ultrasonic sensor is in direct sunlight, it can actually heat up the sensor, uh, which affects the calculation for the speed of sound. So most ultra ultrasonic sensors will have a temperature sensor built into it, uh, which then will um, help it correctly uh, calculate the speed of sound, um, because if it's in a warmer or colder air, the echo will travel faster. So if it's in direct sunlight, put a sunshade over it. If it's uh, underground, a sunshade is not required. For those of you that are asking about the presentation, um, we will have this available after the webinar and we will be sending it out to all attendees along with a recording of uh, today's webinar. So uh, one of the questions that came in is, uh, why would a sensor provide negative uh, levels uh, when they've calibrated it several times? Negative levels could be a result of a uh, blocked reference line. And so 
what would happen is if the reference to atmospheric pressure is uh, blocked, uh, when the barometric pressure changes, you will actually see the level rise and fall with changes in the barometric pressure. So the first thing I would check on that is the desiccant tube. Um, you know, change your desiccant, look for any obstructions that uh, could block it from referencing the atmosphere. And, uh, and sometimes I see this happens that after somebody has removed the sensor, they've cleaned it and they accidentally got water in the reference line. So if you look at the end of your sensor, there's gonna be a vent tube and uh, we just need to make sure that that is clear. I have another question about the, uh, they have a, a deep manhole where they want to monitor flow. Uh, how, they said the flow is erratic and contains considerable solids. They have a bubbler, uh, but to weigh down the tube at the bottom would uh, distort the flow readings. Uh, what I would do with, with that is uh, we sell a mounting plate. It's about a one foot square rectangular mounting plate and we have a sensor carrier, which is just a small plate that we can attach that bubble line to. So it's a very small footprint that you would uh, anchor the plate to the bottom of the channel and then you could clip in the in the bubble line to the, the bottom. Uh, as far as, uh, so then you, you just have a small footprint, the, uh, the, the spacer or the uh, uh, mounting plate is only about an inch wide uh, and then the sensor, the stainless steel tube is only gonna raise up about an eighth of an inch. Uh, but as far as that application, it uh, almost sounds, especially with the solids, the laser flow sensor might be a better uh, option for that particular application. Uh, this question about uh, do you have uh, information on this on the software? And can you incorporate rain data into the software? Uh, yes, we have the uh, ISCO FlowLink software, uh, which we also have rain gauges. And so with the FlowLink software, uh, we can uh, simply uh, click and drag rainfall into the same uh, graph. Uh, one, one of the things that I like to use with the, like the area velocity sensor is uh, it can also read temperature. And so if you have an I and I application, and you're trying to determine if we have rainfall coming in, I look at the temperature and you can usually see that uh, as your water level is rising, the temperature tends to, will drop uh, as the rainfall inf infiltrates the pipe. Another question is uh, how much <clears throat> how much dead space overlies an AB sensor? Uh, so the dead space is uh, about one inch, which is the uh, the height of the uh, in pipe area velocity sensor. So it will need uh, at least uh, one inch to be able to read the velocity. It'll read the depth all the way down to about uh, an eighth of an inch, uh, but the sensor would need to be completely covered to read velocity. But um, below one inch, we can do the calculation. Uh, so we can interpolate the velocity uh, below one inch. Uh, there's a question about uh, trying to develop a rating curve for a river that is not uh, weightable at high flows. There's no weir or flume. We've tried 
uh, other technologies such as the ADCP with limited success. Would the laser flow work in this application? Uh, the laser flow, it could work, but it depends on the uh, uh, if the velocity through that uh, channel or stream is uh, uniform. Is we're, we're going to be reading a, a, a small section of the channel with the uh, and it will read so the laser flow read the velocity, but it's expect through the flow calculations it, it's expecting uniform velocity across that entire channel. So as far as an application like that, there are multiple ways that we could uh, discuss this or um, um, we could approach this and. Uh, if you could uh, just contact uh, me at uh, tele 9 isco uh, later and I'd be happy to discuss this application with you. Question is, can I get um, can I get real-time remote readings from any of these sensors and is the uh, Bluetooth an option? Uh, so as far as the real-time readings, we do have modems, and so we can, uh, if you call it up using the ISCO Flowlink software, you can see the real-time data. Uh, we also have our Flowlink Pro, which you can push the data. Uh, it wouldn't be uh, real-time. You, you can push as fast as every five minutes. Commonly, the data is pushed to our to your server every hour or every four hours, uh, but uh, we, it does have the option to what we call variable rate push. Um, so it, during normal events, you can have the data push every hour, but then when a storm event occurs, uh, which you can define that as a change in level, and so then you can have it start to push your server more often so you get uh, near real-time readings. Uh, as far as Bluetooth, uh, at this moment, we do not have uh, Bluetooth. Uh, stay tuned on the uh, Bluetooth. Uh, we'll have that soon. Thank you. Let's see. Uh, question is, uh, what's the min and max width that a laser can measure? Uh, that actually depends on uh, how close the laser is to the surface of the water. Uh, if it's uh, very close to the water, it's going to cover uh, a span of uh, a couple of inches, three or four inches. Uh, but if it's uh, higher, say mounted uh, 10 feet away, the um, the laser beam angle uh, will spread, give you a further spread, so you may be reaching a couple of feet. So there's a question about the uh, electromagnetic flow meters uh, for half and full pipes. Um, so as far as this webinar, we're only discussing covering the open channel flow measurement at this time. Uh, which one, Tori? Uh, this question, how does the water velocity affect the percentage of error readings? Uh, as far as the uh, ISCO sensors, we can read down to a half foot per second up to uh, 15 foot per second. Um, the things that uh, can affect the, uh, the percentage of error uh, is if you had a, a really low level, say uh, two inches of water and seven foot per second for an in-pipe area velocity sensor, the water can actually ramp off the face of the sensor, 
Um, and so actually using a non-contact like the laser flow would be a better option if you have a high velocity, low level, such as uh, say you have a steep slope, uh, can create that type of a scenario. There's a question about the uh, continuous wave submerged sensors, uh, such as the 2150 and 350 sensors. How accurate are they in very low flows? Um, as that relates to the last question. Um, so, it, you know, if you have the uh, uh, low low levels, high velocity, I would recommend using the non-contact sensor. Um, if it's uh, then the, the follow-up on that is, what if the water depth is above 25 inches? The uh, uh, below 25 inches, uh, I would use the in-pipe area velocity sensor or the laser flow sensor. Above 25 inches, I would use the laser flow sensor because it's going to read below, just below the surface of the water to pick up the peak velocity, which then is uh, calculated into an average velocity. Uh, whereas a in-pipe uh, area velocity sensor uh, would not be able to uh, essentially profile and read um, the velocity above, typically above 30 inches. There's another question about the laser flow sensor. They have it installed on a channel uh, where it's almost empty and the flow is low, and, the, uh, and they've had some issues with some uh, velocity spiking. Uh, what could be happening there is I would take a close look at the channel, because that lower flow, if we have any debris on the bottom of that uh, channel, it's actually creating turbulence and swirling. And so the laser, depending on where it's uh, shooting at, it could be actually picking up the eddy currents uh, which are accelerated as it goes around the debris in the channel. So I, uh, my recommendation is to uh, clean the channel first. Well, that's all the questions that we're uh, handling for uh, right now. Uh, if you have uh, further questions, uh, please contact me at uh, ISCO. The product support line is 866-298-6174 or go to the ISCO website and we'll have, a, have the phone number posted there as well. And I appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. And just a reminder that this presentation will be sent out to all attendees later on this week. Um, and if you have any questions or concerns, you can also contact uh, myself, Tori Stones, and I can get you where you need to go. Thanks so much and have a great day.